All right, so hey there. We're going to take a look through a few of our modeling and optimization problems that we have. Um, I'm going to walk you through the steps that I would think about as setting things up. I'm not going to go through to solve everything, but I'm going to go through the basics of how we are solving, how we are figuring some things out. So in class, we did a few of these already. We talked about uh, the perimeter of the square. Um, I'm going to go on. This is, you can see up top, modeling and optimization. This is the third one. Uh, we had this on formative as well as in our Google Classroom uh, from last week. So I'm just going to walk through and work through things. Um, I'm going to do the second one. It says a rectangle is inscribed in a semicircle of radius 2. So there's the red semicircle. X, Y is some point in quadrant 1 is the vertex of the rectangle is on the equation or on the circle with the equation y equals the square root of 4 minus x squared. So thinking about this, part uh, number 3, write a function to express the area of the rectangle. So here's my thought process along the way. Get this down to a different screen. I'm going to think about kind of the verbal model and then turn this into the math talk along the way. So I'm going to pull this up and type this. There we go. It would help to have prepped this all before, but here we are. I'm going to wait for that to load. All right. So number three. Number three, so write in a function to express the area of the rectangle as a function of x. So thinking area of a rectangle, a equals rectangle length times width or base times height. Those are just different letters, doesn't matter. Thinking about this in terms of like the coordinate plane, our base is that distance left to right. Our height is that distance up down. Well, since we're on the coordinate plane, we've got this point, the center point, the origin, 0, 0. We've got some coordinate x, y on the curve. Well, thinking about what that means, x, y, coordinate, that tells us how much, how much we are moving left, right, and then up, down. So here, to get to that coordinate x, y, we would have to go from the origin, x units to the right, and then y units up. Well, base height. We can see clearly there that the y is our height. The base, well, that's x. That would be also x on the other side. So base times height, our area really is 2x because it's 2x going all the way across the bottom multiplied by the height, which is y. But here's the problem. We can't have 2xy in our equation. We need this a function of one variable. Going back to the description, write a function to express the area of the rectangle as a function of x, just x. We need to replace that y, substitute that y with something in terms of x. That's where we go back to the formula that we have. The equation of that curve is y equals square root of 4 minus x squared. We've got something that connects the x and the y that we can use as a substitution. So instead of y, I'm going to replace it with that statement, 4 minus uh, the square root of 4 minus x squared. So that's going to be square root of 4 minus x squared. Hey, look at that. We have an equation for the area in terms of just x. Follow through. Number 5 says graph the area function. We will graph that. And what is the value for x for which a is the largest? That implies that we should be looking for a maximum. We're going to have some sort of curve in which we're going to have a maximum value. There we go. All right, taking a look at the second one, number four. Write a function p equals, so to express the perimeter of the rectangle as a function of x. So I'm thinking here, perimeter, rectangular perimeter. Perimeter, we know, is 2 times the length plus 2 times the width for a rectangle, or... 2 times base plus 2 times the height. Thinking about it in those terms, we go back to our coordinate plane. Well, the base is 2x. We know that the base is 2x from last time. The height is still the y. We know the y equals square root of 4 minus x squared. So let's make those substitutions that up a little bit. So our perimeter is 2 times the base. It's going to be 2 times the base. Well, the base is 2x plus 2 times the height. The 
height is the square root of 4 minus x squared. I can simplify this, combine, or do the multiplication. 2 times 2x, that is 4x. And there we have an equation for our perimeter just in terms of x. I want to graph that function, find the value of x for which p is the largest. Again, I would plug that into either graphing calculator, Desmos, some kind of graphing utility, and look for that maximum point on our curve. All right, my drawings. Let's go on, take a look at the next one. Open box maximum volume is to be made from a square material. Uh, square material, square piece of material, 24 inches on a side. So let's draw that and take a look at what we have. We've got a square piece of material, 24 by 24. We're going to create a box. Uh, we're going to cut equal squares from the corners and turn up the sides. Uh, it is also it tells us it's an open box, so there is no top on that. So we're going to cut in squares from each side. What do we need to do? Write a function, uh, v equals to express the volume of the box in terms of the size of each cut square x. So we're going to be cutting in on each side x units. We're going to take that and fold it up. Now, the way I think about it is, okay, we cut out the square, and then those sides fold up. You can see me up in the top right. So the sides fold up, giving us that height to our box. So each one of those is going to be x. Building an equation, building an equation, we know, we got to switch over to the mouse, volume of a box is length times width, times, not eight, times the height. Well, length and width are going to be the same here. Looking at the diagram, the original is 24 all the way across, left to right, or up down even. So it's originally 24 inches on each side. We are reducing that by x. We are reducing that by two x on each side. So we're cutting in by x, we're cutting in by x. So the length, is then 24, and we are reducing it by 2x. The width is the same thing, because it was 24, we were reducing it by x, reducing it by x. Since our length and the width were the same, it's not squared. The height is that side once we're folded up, it's going to be x. I'm just going to move that into the beginning. So multiply it out in front. It does not matter if it's multiplied out in front or in the back. Um, second term, multiplication is commutative. We can switch the order there. So there is a statement for volume in terms of how big of a square we are cutting out of each corner. Go back. Next, we would graph that. We'll plug that into Desmos, our graphing calculator, our graphing utility, whatever we have. Find the value of x for which the volume is the largest. We look for that maximum point. Now, what's a reasonable domain? I'm going to actually pull this one up and mention that. So I'm going into Desmos. I'm going to leave my drawing over there on the side for right now. Um, our volume, come on, our volume is, uh, I'm going to use my function notation, it's x multiplied by 24 minus 2x squared. Now I've written this just out of habit. x is the length of that we're cutting out. v is the volume. So that just reminds me that when I look at the graph, when we have a coordinate, well, I'm going to change my window manually. So we can see that, all right, we're not going to have a negative volume. It also doesn't make the sense to cut out anything to the left, so we're not going to have x be negative. It also doesn't make any sense to cut out anything x greater than 12. If we look back at our function, the zeros of this function are 0 and 12. If you cut 12 on each side, you would be cutting the entire uh, material in half. So a reasonable window oh, is going to be from x equals 0 to 12. Now, I might go a little bit less than that, so maybe negative 5 to 17, just to see a little bit on either side. Get out of the way. 
still don't see the entire graph there, so I'm going to go back and adjust that. I'm going to go from negative 5 to 17, just so I get 5 units to the left, 5 units to the right. My y-axis does not make sense to have a negative volume, so negative 50 and 300. I can see my graph is still going up, maybe 500. Nope. 1,000. Ah, almost there at the top. Let's go back and 1,500. Hey. By adjusting it, now I can just move it around. All right. When x equals 4, when we cut out 4 inches from each side, we have a volume of 1,024. So not just x, y, but x, v, based upon, that's why I kept it in my function notation, so I could think about the meaning of those pieces in context. Reasonable domain, we're going to go from 0 to 12, because you can't cut out less than 0, can't cut out more than 12. So think about what makes sense in context. All right, come on back, and clear that diagram, and scroll on. That last one now, give me some more room, write a function a to express the area of the rectangle in terms of x. Area of the rectangle, okay. Area of a rectangle, starting base times height. Thinking in context of the problem, base, I'm just going to say left to right, height, is that up down. So we've got rectangle with each vertex on the ellipse. Well, we've got some xy, thinking about the meaning of that coordinate xy means that we move to the, excuse me, to the right x and up y. An ellipse is symmetric, so if we move to the right x, we've also moved to the left x. If we've moved up y, we've also moved down y. So this tells us that the base is 2x. This tells us that the height is 2y. Going back to our formula, area is base times height. Well, area is the base is 2x. The height is 2y. So our area is 4xy. But we've got this in terms of both x and y. We need it just in terms of x, just to function in terms of one variable. So we need something that connects x and y so we can make a substitution. That's where I'm going to go back to the equation of the ellipse, since we know that there is this relationship x, y for any point on that curve. It's defined by that. I can take that ellipse equation. I'm going to solve for one of them. I'm going to solve for y. Walk through the steps here just to put that out. So we have the equation x squared over 16 plus y squared over 9 equals 1. If I subtract, since this is positive, I'm going to subtract the x squared over 16 to the other side. I'm going to physically copy and paste or cut and paste. I've got y squared divided by 9, divided by 9. I'm going to multiply the entire equation by 9. So if we multiply everything by 9, multiply 9 and distribute to the other side, fix that up with 9 minus 9x squared over 16. And then to eliminate the square, I'm going to take the square root. I'm going to take the square root of the right side. We have the square root of 9 minus 9x squared over 16. There's that common factor of 9, and we could factor out a, a 3 out of the square root. Uh, we could get a common denominator of 16. We can do something. It is what it is. Just leave it. So we've got a is to point at it. You can't see me pointing. All right. A is 4xy. So A is 4xy is this statement. So I'm going to just make that substitution. There's a formula for our area in terms of just x. We can take that, graph it, and here we're trying to find the maximum. We're going to have some curve where there is a highest point, a maximum point. All right, there's a few problems there. I'm going to go on to the other assignment that we had uh, modeling and optimization for. 
do a few of those problems, and then I'm going to call it a night. Uh, where's my other one? All right, modeling and optimization four. Uh, this first one here, wire 10 meters long is to be cut into two pieces as indicated in that picture. One piece will be shaped as a square and the other piece will be shaped as a circle. So that 4x section is going to turn into x. So it's x by x by x by x, 4x, four sides. That 10 minus 4x is going to be rolled around into a circle. Express the total area, A, enclosed by the pieces of the wire as a function of the length x of the square. All right. Here's what I see, total area A, total area, that's going to be the area of the square along with the area of the circle. So thinking a verbal model, my area, that's going to be the rectangle along with the, uh, not the rectangle, but yeah, the rectangle square along with the circle. Putting that into math terms. Well, we know the area of a square, it's got side x, it's going to be x squared. Area of a circle, we know is pi r squared. Well, we've got two variables once again. We've got x and we've got r. We need something that connects that x and that r so we can make a substitution. That's where this other piece comes into play. That 10 minus 4x is curled around into the circle. At 10 minus 4x, that length, length is the length of the circle. That's the perimeter. That's the circumference. So that gives us that 10 minus 4x is 2 pi r. That's the equation for the circumference. This gives us a connection between x and r. If we solve this, I'm going to have, I'm going to solve it for r. I'm going to divide by 2 pi. It's going to be 10 minus 4x divided by 2 pi. I notice that 10, 4, and 2 are all multiples of 2. I will factor out a 2 from everything. I've got 5 minus 2x over pi. Our area uses that r, so now I'm going to make a substitution. So area is x squared plus pi. It was, is r squared, but instead of using the r variable, I'm going to make this substitution. There's a 5 minus 2x over pi. I'll make that substitution. There, I've got a statement for the area in terms of just x. We can graph that and answer the question that's being asked. For what value of x is a the smallest? So now there should be a minimum point on our curve. There's our function in terms of just the size x. All right, I'm going to skip number two. Can I go to number three? Something like that always shows up. Not that number two doesn't always show up, but number three has a few different parts there. And I want to look at the graph for that. Clear that out. Number three, p equals xy be some point on the graph of y equals x squared minus eight. That's this point over on the right side. So that's sum coordinate x, y. We want to express the distance. Ah, coordinate, distance, distance formula is what I'm thinking. So we want the distance from that point P to the origin. There's our second point. So 0, 0, that's our origin point. We've got y equals x squared minus 8. We're looking for some point on that. Distance, I'm queued in for the distance formula. Let me erase that. As a reminder, distance formula is not the square root. It is the radical. It's x sub 2 minus x sub 1 quantity squared plus the same thing with the y's. y sub 2 minus y sub 1 quantity squared. We've got some point x, y. I might just say that x2, oop, oop, oop. Uh, y2 
that's our point x, y. Might say that x sub 1, y sub 1 is our origin, is the point 0, 0. So I can substitute that in to the equation there. I'm going to copy and paste it so I'm not typing the whole thing over again. x2 is xy, or x2, y2 is just xy, right out of the equation, x1, y1 is 0, 0. It does not matter which is which because addition, subtraction, it doesn't matter which one we label as x1, y1 because we'd be subtracting in the same order. It works itself out once we square things. Now, you can see obviously x minus 0, I don't need to include that 0 y minus 0, obviously I don't need to include that minus 0. So the distance is x squared plus y squared, but our distance is in terms of two different variables there. We need to eliminate that y, get it in terms of just x, just one variable. Well, ah, back to the description. y equals x squared minus 8, that's the equation of that curve. That's the equation of that curve. That gives us a connection between y and x. So rather than y, we can make that substitution with what y is equal to, x squared minus 8. So we've got our distance from our point to the origin. It's given by that formula. I'm going to take this. I'm going to put this into Desmos. Let's take a look at what we have here. So everything that we are looking at that, let me go back to my home, we have this curve, y equals uh, x squared minus 8. We have the coordinate 0, 0. We want to know what point on this curve is closest to that point 0, 0. So we came up with the distance was the square root of x squared plus x squared minus 8, Ooh, that looks fun, squared. And you look, okay, well, the purple graph and that blue, they don't look like they cross anywhere. The purple graph is the distance. It isn't about where it crosses. The purple graph tells us the distance between any point on the blue graph, our parabola, our x squared minus 8, and that point, the origin. We want the minimum distance. So we're going to be looking at those minimums. The x value here, now think about our function. d equals x squared. So our input is x. Our input is the x on the coordinate axis, on the horizontal axis. The y, the output, this is not the coordinate that is closest on the blue graph. The value, the output here, that is the distance. So our x is plus or minus, positive or negative, 2.739. I'm going to change this. Instead of y equals, just for ease, I'm going to say f of x equals x squared minus 8. What we come away from with the purple graph, our distance, so we've got negative 2.739. That was right, right? 2.739. I'm going to create a coordinate, comma, f of 2.739. Do the same thing, positive. Those points are on the blue curve. Those are the points that are closest to the origin. It turns out that if you were to draw a line from the origin to the blue curve, to our parabola, that segment would be perpendicular at that point. We'd have a right angle. The closest, the shortest segment between a point and something else would be at a right angle. Now, there are those points. That x coordinate is the 2.739 or the negative 2.739. 2.784, that is the distance. The coordinate on the blue curve is that negative 2.739 or positive 2.739 and negative 0.498. This is x, this is y. This was x, this is d. Be careful with that. Those are the two coordinates that are closest to the parabola. We've got two of them 
because our parabola is symmetric. All right, get that out. Let's go try another one. Right, I've done that, it's done that a few times. Look at number six here. We've done a few of these over and over again. And it helps to have a good drawing along the way. We've got an island is four miles from the nearest point P on a straight shoreline. A town is located 20 miles down the shore from P. So we've got our town, there's our shoreline. The drop. We've got our island. The straight line distance to point P is, what does it say? Four miles. Town, let me give that T, is 20 miles away. So there's 20 miles away. We are going to take a boat from our island to the shore and then go to town. Got to pick up groceries, got to do something. We could go straight to shore and then jog the whole way because our car is on the island or our vehicle is on the island. We could go straight to the town. We might go somewhere in between. So what I want to think about is, okay, we can boat eight miles per hour. We can jog four miles per hour. All right, express the time t. That's our goal. As a function of x, where x is the distance from p to where the person lands the boat. So that tells me, all right, I've got this distance from straight ashore to where we land is x miles. That tells me from where I land to the town, that's going to be 20 minus x. Because the whole thing was 20, and we've taken away that x. Now, we need the time. Here's where I'm going to think about what that means. Clear that out. So, a verbal model. Thinking about, in words, what makes sense. We want the time. Well, we're going to spend time boating along with time running or jogging. Well, how do we find those individual pieces? We're covering some distance. We know rates and we want time. Distance, rate, time. Well, that goes back to our equation. D equals RT. Distance equals rate times time. Distance equals rate multiplied by time. Or if I resolve this, work it backwards, time is equal to distance divided by the rate. So that's the time boating, is the distance boating divided by the rate of boating. Look at that. If I say T sub B for boating is equal to the distance that we boat divided by the rate that we boat. We can do that. Well, the distance boating, uh, that's this diagonal line here. That's that diagonal section. Well, that's a right triangle because it's the shortest distance to shore. 4x Pythagorean theorem will get us that that distance is going to be 16 plus x squared inside the square root. So our distance boating is the square root of 16 plus x squared. We know the rate boating. We can boat an average of 8 miles per hour on the water. Do the same thing for running. So t for r for running is going to be the distance running divided by the rate uh, we are running. So the time running, the distance running, we've got 20 minus x. And our rate for running is 4 miles per hour. So our total time is the time boating plus the time running. The time boating is given the distance boating divided by the rate boating. So I'm going to take those and build this function. So our total time 
So distance divided by rate for boating plus what we have for running. So I'm going to copy those and make that substitution. We have a function in terms of the distance x that gives us the total time. Let's graph this and make sense out of this. Let me clear all of my drawings. Get that. So we've got time based upon x was uh, we've got the square root of 16 plus x squared over 8 plus we have 20 minus x over 4. All right, there's our curve. Uh-oh. It just looks like it keeps on going. Does it ever? Huh. How about that? What are we going to do? Well, let's make sense out of this in context. This curve shows us the distance from straight across shore that we should land to give us the time. So it compares the distance that we are landing down shore to the time that we spent. What numbers make sense? I know I deleted our drawing. And what's the shortest that we can land down shore? Well, you're zero. You're not going to land further away from town. You're not going to land to the left because that would give us a greater time that we've got to jog. So in terms of what numbers make sense contextually, our x value has to be at least zero. Also, how far away from shore, oh, straight across, can we land? So if we put that back in, we've got our island straight across. There's our town. We're going to land. Now, this is fluid. This is flexible. That x is somewhere out there. Well, we can't land to the left because that would be negative. That would be adding time, obviously. The other thing is we're not going to overshoot the town. The greatest distance x can be is 20. So the greatest value that makes sense for x in context of this problem is 20. So really, what we are saying is, what's the shortest time, the least time, anywhere between x being 0 and x being 20? We see that we are constantly decreasing there. It's always going down from left to right. So the shortest time, the smallest time, the least time, is if we just boat straight to shore since we can do that so much faster than what we can run. If we land at town, that will be our least amount of time. Now here are variables. 20, that's our x. That x is our distance down the shore. Our y, our output, is actually t, back to our function. That would take us 2.55 hours, two and a half hours. There we've answered the question. There's a few examples. Try it out. Let me know if we have anything else that we need to work through, and we'll go from there. Good luck.